We're on the quad, I've been at Google for two years. Um, and I guess a year and a half in, I had the opportunity to travel with Casey and his nonprofit, Effect.org, to Nepal um, a month, two months after the earthquake. Um, and I, you know, was under the impression we're going to go see what it was like, learn about like the disaster that had happened. How can we help them rebuild? And also maybe how can we implement potential high and low tech solutions for that? But a lot of what I learned was about how human trafficking in that part of the world um, was a huge problem, right? And it's not one that's often sort of talked about, especially in in the US and the media here. And after the earthquake, human trafficking went up 200% in Nepal. And that for me was a statistic that I have like not let go because um, it's really upsetting. You're seeing all this damage very physically, but you know, kind of behind the scenes, what is happening to you know, like people's bodies and their lives is changing so drastically. Um, so to introduce Casey, he founded Effect.org um, in 2010. Yes, um, to with the, with the aim of building rural schools in India. Um, after he traveled abroad internationally um, in college, he sort of came across the concept that education can change everything. Through his own education, right, as he was abroad, he was learning that, but through education of anyone anywhere in the world. So he founded Effect to sort of build schools to help teach um, people in rural India. And not long after they had built their first school, they started realizing that their female students weren't coming to school anymore. And they started asking questions and no one was really answering the questions. And as they started to dig a little deeper, they started to realize that a lot of it was because those female students were kind of disappearing or being trafficked. So then that sort of changed the direction of what he was doing at the time um, and led him to make a, a documentary. And here is Casey. It's it's great to come back to Google. Um, we seem to find ourselves here a few times a year, and um, it's great to present and talk a little bit more about what we're doing and to um, let you guys uh, know some of the, some of the opportunities that you can get involved with uh, with human trafficking and uh, some of the issues that are happening to our neighboring countries. Um, so thank you, Chloe, for the introduction. Um, so let's just jump right into the topic that we're doing today. So um, how tech or technology is disrupting human trafficking. So really, um, that's going to be our topic today. Um, and I want to give some insight of essentially what's happening with human trafficking, why it's happening, why it's growing, uh, what are the solutions behind it, and what you guys can do to help essentially stop it. Um, so as to make this all work, I just want to talk a little bit more about where we got our start and how we got involved and how we found out about it. And hopefully that this will help you build some context on the issue um, yourselves. And um, so we'll start with, so we started Effect.org um, back in college. Um, actually, one of the co-founders is with us here today, um, Moline. She wants to raise her hand. Um, so we both went to the same university, um, Utah State. Um, go Aggies. It's a small university, but um, uh, that's where we started working on Effect. And um, we opened our first school back in 2010. So we were both sophomores in college, um, quite young, quite uh, had the whole world in front of us. And we're really <clears throat> excited about the opportunities to, to see if we could disrupt education in India. So we started working with our, um, our Indian colleagues or friends that were going to the university there. And we started working in a state called Bihar. So Bihar is close to 100 million people. 80% um, is rural. Um, quite an eye-opening trip to go there for the first time uh, when I was uh, 23 and just overwhelmed with all these new smells and sounds and busyness. And um, that's where we actually opened our school. We opened our first school in Bihar in this uh, small little village. And as we would make trips in between during like spring break or during uh, Christmas break, we'd go in to the school and we start seeing some discrepancies between our male and female students. And as we started to investigate more and more, um, we would see that uh, the girls essentially, why they were missing. So we'd go talk to the parents and there was always different uh, answers for why some of the girls were missing, but some of them we never did get any answers for. And one day I was speaking to one of the local lawyers, and he was telling me how girls are trafficked from this area every day. And I had never heard that. I didn't understand that that was actually happening. So as we started to talk to him more, um, found out that this was very, very common, um, that they were usually taken to Delhi or, um, or to Kolkata, but usually they're going to Delhi, and they were being told that they were going to go be dishwashers or they were going to go 
be nannies or do housework and make um, make some extra money. And the parents, because they're living day to day in poverty, are excited for these opportunities and let their daughters go. Um, usually reluctantly, with tears, they let the daughters go, and then a lot of times they never see them again. Um, they try to follow up with the person who trafficked them, who took them, and they disappear. Um, and being 23 and being a sophomore in college, I was I was shocked. I was pissed, and then I was shocked, maybe both, um, because it was happening in front of us. Um, and as we started to investigate and, and, and look at what was happening all throughout India, that it was literally happening in every village. It was happening all over the place that essentially families were being tricked into letting their daughters go to work. And then they were being trapped into this really, really, really bad situation. Um, so we had talked about how we could respond to this. And we had been using uh, video as a medium to share our work with a lot of our supporters. And we knew that a documentary would be really powerful as far as showing what's actually happening. Um, and the reason why we came to that conclusion is because as we would tell people, both in India and back at home, what was happening with human trafficking, a lot of them would shake their heads and say, no, that's not happening. That's impossible. This is not happening. And even some of the folks who've been on our expeditions um, have found when they travel to India, that they'll be sitting next to someone that said, no, that, I don't know what you're talking about. This, that does not happen in my country. And, uh, and they get really frustrated. No, no, it absolutely happens. And um, so these are good conversations for us to have right now. They're good conversations to talk about why it's happening and what we can do to solve it and to have these open conversations because a lot of people want to hide from it. They, for some reason, they think this is scary, that this isn't, you know, that this is a problem that's happening in a far, far land and we shouldn't talk about it. Um, but actually it's happening here in Mountain View. It's happening, <laughs> it's happening in San Francisco, it's happening in Oakland. So these are conversations that we do need to have. Um, so we believe that a, a documentary could be really eye-opening and uh, share some light about what was happening um, in India itself. So in 2014, I started with a good friend, a film director named Chris Davis, and um, he had just got divorced. He was tired of, he was making really good money in the work that he was doing, and he broke away from all of it and pretty much came on board with me to make nothing <laughs> and uh, started filming the documentary. So um, we would worked for about four or five months. We came back to the States and we had no money. We <laughs> completely ran out of money. We started going to investors, started going to uh, foundations, started going to all these different places trying to raise money. And everyone said, no, you're crazy. This, this isn't going to work. Um, so then we said, well, we'll turn to Kickstarter because we've heard of great things happening on Kickstarter. So we spent months doing research about how to have a successful campaign. We only looked at successful campaigns. We never once looked at a failed campaign because we were not going to be a failure. We were going to be successful. And we only looked at campaigns that raised over $100,000. I look back at this and I think we're absolutely crazy. Um, but that's what we did because we were convinced. And the team that helped w with us on this is all here today. Um, and so we launched a campaign. We had two launch parties, one in Salt Lake City where Chris Davis lives, the director, and then one here in San Francisco where the uh, rest of my team and myself lives. And um, the big goal was $100,000, and we pretty much got to $30,000 installed. Um, and with Kickstarter, as you know, you have to raise the full amount that you decide in the beginning or you get nothing. And so when my parents heard that, they were like, what? Are you crazy? Why would you do something where you can't get what the people have given you already? Um, and I had to explain to them that it's the urgency that, to get more people involved. And, and so that's what we were pretty much begging anyone to write a story about what we're doing. Um, so we got to about three days left on the campaign and we still had a gap of about $45,000 to raise. And I mean, I couldn't sleep. <laughs> it was a, a quite a miserable time, but um, our team worked relentlessly uh, bugging journalists to write a story on us. And this great thing happened with Huffington Post where they wrote an article about uh, our organization. And then four days later, Upworthy on Saturday night at 1030 put it on their Facebook page and we went viral within Upworthy. So every second we were getting a donation and we blew past our goal. I went to bed at like, we were close to our goal and we ended up piecing the box. We ended up raising $115,000 and 68, $115,000, almost $116,000. Um, woke up that morning pretty much in tears. The whole team was just ecstatic. We couldn't believe. We had just turned a corner that we didn't know was possible. We, we believed in it, but you don't know if it can actually happen until it happens. So quite a special moment for all of us in the team. Um, to know The biggest thing was that everyone told us that, a lot of people told us that it wasn't possible. A lot of people told us that um, this film wasn't, didn't matter, I guess. And we knew it mattered. And we knew that other people knew that it mattered. And so when we had all these people messaging from Australia, from Europe, from 
uh, from South America even, they're saying, I donate to you because I care about this issue and I want to see it stopped. I can't wait to see your film. Um, those messages that meant so much to us. And so when we had this new funding, we were able to move forward. We were able to uh, formulate a bigger team and to start uh, filming the documentary. One thing that was new to us is that documentaries are they're stupidly expensive. <laughs> um, it's really hard to get people to come on you on just a, a merit base that this is going to be worthwhile. Um, but luckily, we were able to find that with a team. We actually formulated two other filmmakers who were just so passionate about this issue that they dropped everything. We paid them essentially their expenses, and that was it. And we went out and we filmed. Um, so we filmed from pretty much from the moment from 2014, we filmed, took a break to do the Kickstarter, and then we filmed almost all of two, 2015. And you know, the the experience of it has 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 brought us where we're at today, where we get to learn all these different issues about human trafficking. So what ended up happening is that as a producer, I would usually conduct most of the interviews. And we'd sit down with these girls, and they would just dump their souls out onto, onto film and, and, and to you. And the whole film crew was crying, and we're having this terrible experience of under, you know, hearing the story. And we're trying to figure out how can we share this with, with everyone else? How can we actually share and give this merit of what's going on here? Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we believe that we're doing that, um, not only with the film, but also with, um, with our expeditions that we do. We have some folks here who've been on our trips and about how you can touch, feel, see, and actually get involved to make a difference. So the film, um, uh, we started filming mainly in, in Kathmandu, in, in, in Nepal. We filmed all over Nepal. And then we went to Kolkata in India, filmed all over Kolkata and the regions around Kolkata. And then we went to um, down to Mumbai and shot Mumbai for a long time. Um, in Mumbai, we actually lived in the brothels. Uh, we were there for three weeks, uh, living in um, on Farkland Lane, if those who've been to Mumbai. Um, most people from Mumbai have never been to these places, <laughs> I believe. <laughs> um, so it was, uh, but by the end of our stay there, we were no longer <laughs> welcome. So we had to leave. Um, but uh, and then and then we went to Delhi. So these are really the hot spots. Um, and some of you might ask why why India? You know, I mean, the easy answer would be that this is where we were working. But what we learned though is that India is actually has one of the largest forced prostitution rings in the world. Um, and we're talking almost 350,000 girls who are being trafficked every year. Um, these are numbers that the UN are not reporting. This is a criminal activity, so the numbers are really like out there. That, and, and the UN is really having a hard time actually aligning themselves with any numbers. But if you talk to all these different nonprofits, like we had the opportunity to, it's easy to see how big the problem is. And we believe that 350,000 is, um, is a low number of what's actually happening. Um, so as we filmed this, we actually saw, started to see all these different ways that nonprofits would work to try and end it. And we also saw all the ways that traffickers were doing to win it, to get more girls and to do all these different things. Um, and I just want to show you a little piece of uh, the work that we did with one organization called Shakti Vahini. Uh, and they're based in New Delhi. And um, this is a piece that they that we worked with them on um, that uh, essentially shows what it's like to go rescue girls. So um, this is just a two minute piece. <laughs> Oh, I need to 
It, it is uh, trafficking is the world's second biggest economy and this has to be broken it's huge it, 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 it's especially if i'm talking about india are young girls turn, turning into the brothels after all in india as per the national human rights report 50000 girls goes missing every year 50000 girls goes missing every year where are those girls landing into some may be may be found but where are the others and it is our responsibility it is our responsibility to search each and every girl in india brothels are illegal in india brothels are illegal but why this exists i don't know um so that was uh, taken in new delhi uh one of the larger uh red light districts uh, called GB Road, and as you can see, they are very sophisticated at hiding these girls when the police come. Um, so when Shakti Bahini, they do the most raids probably out of any organization in, in India, and they do it with a budget of about $150,000. Um, if you want to look at what uh, the other big organizations that are doing, anti-human trafficking budgets they have are insane. And these guys are literally kicking down doors and doing amazing work. And um, but one thing that that was the founder um and what he what he'll tell you not on camera but so so much in personal conversations is that they used to rescue a girl or two a week um now they're getting three or four requests a day he can't even keep up and he's like they're so passionate about it but they're so passionate about it because of the, the problem is growing so so largely and as you can see they're very sophisticated about hiding the girls so in this case, they were, they were able to, they actually have blueprints from the other trafficking uh, or raids that they've done. So they know where they can actually see maybe where they've hidden them before. So they can go in and get the girls out. Uh, if you notice the girls, they were speaking Hindi back and forth, but they, in, in the translation, they say speak Bengali. Because most of these girls are not from, they're not from the region. Most of them don't even speak Hindi. Most of them speak Bengali. Most of them speak Nepali. They're not from these areas. And they, they love that. As traffickers, they love to keep them where they can't actually understand the languages so that they can keep them grounded. A lot of times they take their passports to take any identification they have so they can't leave. Um, and you can see this woman in the left corner, she's got acid that's been sprayed all over her face uh, for a moment, for a time that she tried to leave. Um, girls in the bottom right corner are those that they're trying to seek, ones who live in rural villages, ones who parents are seeking um, to put them into work to get them opportunities, but they're not, aware of the uh the wolves that are dressed in, in sheepskin so um one of the stories i want to share next with you is a girl that we um affectionately call renu that's not her real name but we don't share her real name um, but she was trafficked when she was quite young from nepal um she was taken to um to india to new delhi and as a young girl at 13 she was raped 20 to 25 times a day and she shares her story and i can't really give it justice so i'm just going to show her interview um and uh, there is hope, people, but it's important that we at least show what's happening. And many of them are brought in just so young. At 13, what do you understand? What do you know about life? And from one day, from being a free being, a young girl full of hope, full of aspirations, you become somebody who's, who's going to be a slave for, for most part of her life. If not slave only of one person or one system, is a slave of that experience. That is never going to leave it. And it does not. No matter how much rehabilitative support we give, no matter how much counseling we do, that trauma is impossible. Renu was one of these girls, trafficked at a young age, 
she has undergone situations that are unfathomable. Renu was one of the lucky ones. After eight months of being abused by Indian men, she and one other girl escaped. She returned back to Nepal and through the assistance of a local non-profit, she prosecuted her captors for trafficking her. Many young women are trafficked into the sex trade and only a few ever escape. Um. So Renu's story is, uh, is, is common actually. The, the girls are trafficked when they're young. And when I when I say common, usually they never get out. Um, she's one of the few that actually gets the um, that was escaped. Um, she pretty much what we see usually what happens is the girls who escape they escape within the first year because they are just absolutely terrified of what's going on. And they want to get out. If they can't get out within that year, then it's, we see that the chance of them getting out is, is very slim. They they, they begin to accept their destiny, um, which is. Uh, unfortunate, but um, she escaped within eight months. Uh, what ended up happening is her her trafficker, her same trafficker, came back with another girl from her same village, and she said, "If you tell anything to her, I'll kill you both." So as soon as she got a moment, she told her everything. She told her everything that was going on here, and she saw her face, she saw her innocence, and she didn't want the same thing to happen to her. That that happened to her, it happened to this girl that was from the same village. Um, so that night they escaped, they got away. There was an opportunity where they had a quick chance, and they just went, they took it. Um, and they made their way all the way to Kathmandu from Delhi on bus and um, got back. And when they had gotten back, um, she was taken in hands to a larger organization in Kathmandu and then she was passed on to a smaller organization. Um, uh, she is an amazing success story. Um, she's one of the few 
that it just takes, oh, I mean, rescuing them is the easy part. That's what we often say. It's the rehabilitation afterwards that takes potentially years. Um, she's had seven years now. Um, she did a training in Japan where they make a, a special type of, uh, um, of scarf. And she took the training there for two, three months. And she teaches other girls how to do this training. She makes a lot of the jewelry that's coming from this organization that we'll actually talk about one of the organizations that's helping sell the, her, her, the beautiful jewelry that they're doing. And um, she got married. <laughs> she got married four, uh, five months ago to a wonderful guy. Um, their family doesn't know her full story um, because she's, I mean, obviously you'd be embarrassed, but she, um, she's doing well. She came, I mean, she, she's, she's an amazing success story. Um, and, um, but she's been through a lot and, and um, we hope to see more success stories. But um, honestly, this is where we get into more, much more of what we talk about is prevention. How can we prevent this actually from happening to girls like uh, Reno? Um, so, we filmed this documentary. Um, we thought we were pretty much finished in last September, um, and uh, we pretty much had to call the whole crew back, and we went back to India um, to do a lot more undercover work. So a lot of what we do ha had been undercover filming, and uh, we were looking for our main story, which was actually filming um, the parents and a girl being trafficked and being rescued, the whole process, which was proved to be very, very difficult. It took us almost three years to get this. And we got it last November. We got the full story, um, which is our, our key story. So the film's being um, edited in Bangkok right now. So as a very budget organization, we do everything pretty much overseas because we can save a lot more money. But we found some really, really talented, amazing editors um, in Bangkok who are, are taking it. And it'll be released in um, in January. Uh, we're shooting for Sundance. So. Um, so one thing that we noticed is the problem is way, way bigger than anything that we we're seeing. The anyone that was reporting from the UN, from the World Bank, anything that was this problem was massive. And that we had heard this word modern day slavery. Maybe you've seen 12 Years a Slave when you were in high school. If you went to high school in the US and you were taught about the African trade slave, how terrible it was. Um, it is worse right now. What is going on right now is is I can't compare it, but it is it's bigger. It's bigger than was ever happening before. And yet all we see is, you know, Trump head crashes or head headlines. And we see, you know, all these crazy things that the media decides of what we should know. But um, one statistic that really bothers all of us is that, and I'll talk about that a little more, okay, right here, um, is that uh, essentially if you combine all the world tragedies that are happening right now, trafficking is killing more girls than any other of them, all of them combined. They're all dying from HIV. So if you look how big the problem is, and that does not correlate with what we're seeing on TV, um, and that's a bit sad. Um, so um, hopefully this film can change a lot of that. Um, second largest criminal activity, first is drugs. Not too much variance, 31 billion for human trafficking, 32 billion for um, trafficking and drugs. It's gonna pass, trafficking, uh, trafficking will pass drugs um, soon and will be the largest. And the reason being is it's easier and there's, it's low risk. Um, the chances of getting caught are much, much less, and the repercussions are much, much less. Um, the UN actually reported of criminals abandoning drugs over other criminal activities and switching to human trafficking because it's low risk and profitability. Um, so not much as we've seen those then. So why is it growing? Um, traffickers, huge demand. Customers want it. Customers want cheap sex. And um, there's weak, weak laws that don't protect women and uh, them being caught is just very, very minimal. Um, and, and the other side of it is that because of poverty, the number one reason why we have trafficking is because of poverty. Um, parents are living, you know, day to day from very low amount of work and money. And this is something that we've had a hard time being able to express is, you know, a lot of you, if you have children, you, how could you ever let them go work in a, in a foreign city at the age of 13 or 14? Um, but if you have five children, if you lived in a mud hut, if you're barely feeding them, your situation would be different. Um, and that's what we try to show in these trips that we do. Um, and is that you would take a different course, I believe. Um, but even though those are not always the right decisions, um, these poor are desperate for better opportunities and this goes on. Um, so those are the reasons some of the victims are having the problems. Who are the customers? This is a big question that we always got, uh, we always get. Um, if, if you if you look in most of the markets, if you, if you go to Thailand, if you go to Cambodia, it's a little bit more skewed. You, you do have maybe 20, 30 percent coming from foreigners. A lot of times those are coming from other Asian countries that are looking for 
uh, cheap sex. There's a sex tourism, essentially. Um, but all in all, majority of it is locals with local girls. Um, in, the, in India, we're seeing like high, like 98% are Indians uh, visiting Indian brothels. Um, in, in Nepal, same way. The, the brothels that are in Nepal, you're seeing that the uh, majority of the men are, in, are uh, Nepali themselves. So um, uh, people have been trying to figure out why, why it's growing so much. Why is, why is it becoming a norm? And um, some have, have pointed towards urbanization. Um, children, for the first time, are leaving their the generations of families who've lived in the village, and they're actually leaving and going to live in Delhi or Bombay and uh, being influenced by a whole bunch of new things that they've never been influenced before and don't really know how to handle and get into these bad routines or, or ideas that it's okay to, uh, to go to brothels. And actually what we see is the most of the girls who've, who we've um, interviewed who've, been, who've escaped, they've usually escaped because of a client. The client has no idea. I don't know if the client or the, or the customers are the, are the bad guys, but most of them have no idea. They think that they've chosen this path that these girls have chosen to be prostitutes. And once they find out that they were brutally beaten, that they were dragged into this place, they were broken like horses, then they start to think twice about what to do and actually help break them out, uh, which is a huge risk of them being caught. Um, these girls are oftentimes uh, threatened for their lives all the time. They see other girls, they make examples of that who they kill, and so they get scared. So they're constantly living in the fear of, of, of the repercussions of running away. So. So why is this happening? Like I said, it's happening here in Mountain View. Um, Oakland, Sacramento, huge, huge hotspots. Uh, the numbers are scary Or what's happening here in the U.S. about how many girls are being trafficked into the U.S., um, how underground it is. Um, if you follow any big event, Super Bowl especially, um, someone commented from our groups, you know, how they put out a memo to Googlers about how you should be careful about the trafficking, the, 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 the actual trafficking that, during the Super Bowl. And someone commented how interesting, why don't we talk about the actual trafficking that's happening, the human trafficking that's going to happen during the Super Bowl. Um, so more and more of these conversations do matter. Um, but again, India is the largest country of forced prostitution. The largest con uh, country of uh, actual prostitution is, is China. Um, so. Okay, so let's jump to solutions. Um, the most successful solution that we've seen is, the, is, is what happened in, in Sweden. In 1999, they introduced, a, which a lot of people are, are affectionately calling the Sweden model. Um, be careful when you uh, Google that. <laughs> 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 we've had few of our uh, folks do that, and um, they end up getting Swedish models. Um, but Sweden, the Sweden model is, is, is quite fascinating. So Sweden borders next to other countries that have huge, huge problems with, uh, with human trafficking, with, with prostitution. And in, 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 in 1999, they came out with a law that they would only prosecute customers and not the victims themselves, and not the prostitutes. And what they did is they came across all boards with the, with the police, with the judicial system, with everything they came across and said, these are the laws, and they came down hard. And what they ended up seeing is that it became so difficult to run uh, brothels or prostitution houses that they pretty much up and left. They just left and they all went to the Netherlands, unfortunately. <laughs> but they all left and went to other European countries. And so it ended up becoming this model of, you know, this is a really interesting way it works. And if you see that, I put functioning government. So in functioning governments, this seems to work. So maybe you saw the headlines. There's a lot of news coming out the last few weeks. But in the headlines, France actually just passes. They passed the same similar law. Um, other countries have passed it throughout Europe. Cambodia is a good example of a, a country that has passed this law that is, I would say, not so much non-functioning government, but they have passed this law. The reason why I've split the two is because um, this seems to work when, I don't even know if this, if, if this will work very good in the U.S. I really don't. We're, we're, we're just, I mean, we're pretty corrupt, so I don't know. But if, if, you, if you take non-functioning governments where governments seem to have a lot of corruption, um, I'm not so convinced that the student model would work very well in, in a place like India. Um, but it would be a good step forward of, of, of at least saying that these are repercussions that can happen if you, if you traffic a girl, if you're caught with a prostitute, and not actually persecuting or putting women who are prostitutes in jail, because most of them are forced to be there. They're not even, it's not even their choice. Um, so these are some of, the, some of the good solutions that we've seen in non-functioning governments is, is our prevention. And that even means going village to village, door to door, and letting people know that you know, there are wolves and sheep kids, sheep can coming in and that and these are the reasons these are things that you should look out for and we've seen huge success with these programs we've seen very good success with educating girls if you put a girl in a school the chances of the main traffic are so minimal and the reason being is that you have so many different eyes watching this person you know if this girl is saying she's going to school but she's being taken by another guy and being 
you know, talk to, then the parent ends up talking to the, the teacher ends up talking to the parent, and there's just more eyes on the girls to watch for these sensitive situations. Uh, we've seen Interceptive Valuable uh, Vulnerable Girls. This, these are really good programs that we've seen that are in brothels. Um, brothel areas are actually just neighborhoods. And so what ends up happening is the girls who grow up in these neighborhoods actually end up becoming victims. Um, and the young men end up becoming pimps. And so these, we've seen these really amazing programs in Bombay and also in, um, in Calcutta that have essentially intervened and given these people better education, given them better opportunities, given them an, an insight of what's happening and has actually broken that cycle. Um, shaming the government is always good. Um, once they see that as a, as a problem that's being highlighted, I think the Delhi rape can be a very good example, 2012. Um, most of you had to have seen that. Um, absolutely terrible, but if you haven't, uh, a, a young doctor was brutally raped and essentially died from this rape um, by some drunk boys um, who were uneducated and uh, essentially the whole country erupted, especially Delhi, it went crazy um, because this could have been their daughter. This could have been, I think that was their, the realization that this could have been my daughter. Um, and so the whole country erupted and what we saw from that is the government moving very quickly to, in, to um, interject some new laws that have been actually very, very successful and that are sort of working, which is an accomplishment, a huge accomplishment. Um, that was very organic, but um, we do see times when large media campaigns or things like that happen in the government. Um, breaking the trafficking cycle, that's something I didn't want to talk about real quick. If you look at the cycle of you know, supply and demand, if you look at this as a business, we have the traffickers, customers, the brothels, and the girls. Um, essentially, if we're able to break a hole or pop this balloon anyway, we seem to see a, a, a huge a decrease in, in, in the problem. And this is where we're seeing a, a lot of different nonprofits working in each of these sectors. I don't have time to go over how they're each working in these sectors, but it's um, pretty amazing to see how, you know, you know, a lot of times they can shame the customers or they can at least educate the customers or, you know, bring on stronger laws for the traffickers if they're caught. Um, shutting down brothels. Brothels are not legal in India, yet they seem to run just fine. Um, those are things that we are still trying to figure out. Um, they're in some ways very uh, protected by the government or the police that try to stop them themselves. All right. Um, just to, I'm going to finish up here in, in about um, 10 minutes so that we can have a Q&A afterwards um, before we finish. But I do want to get into really the the crux of our, of our conversation is how is tech is actually changing human trafficking? How is it ending? And what we saw during filming the organization is that, sorry, filming this documentary is that very few organizations were actually using technology. And we were shocked by this. As we would go from Bombay to Calcutta to Kathmandu to Delhi and work with all these different organizations, getting these amazing stories, we'd actually start like digging deeper into these organizations, we'd actually look at their finances. We started looking at like what they were doing because we were interested as a nonprofit ourselves and as, as myself of being an entrepreneur trying to figure out, well, what are you doing to, you know, to, to make this more efficient or who are you collaborating with? And we saw all these things that they weren't collaborating. They weren't work using technology. If they were, it was like Excel sheets. So we were trying to figure out why, why aren't you using all these different uh, tools that are out there. Uh, we found one organization that was using Google spreadsheets and we all freaked out. We were like really excited um, because like, I mean, because they saw the power of being able to put something in one sheet and, you know, the person in the other site could actually see it. Um, and so this is really where um, the idea came from with um, starting what we call expeditions. So um, as being a nonprofit, we wanted to give people opportunities to actually understand the issues of human trafficking or all these different things that are happening. And one of them was... What if we brought them to the actual places? What if we brought you to Nepal? What if we brought you to India and let moon shooters like yourselves actually understand the issue on the ground and build technology around that to solve the solution? So that was the idea. We tried it last year and it went really, really well. Um, we had folks that are in this room that came on that trip. Um, so we ended up, today we've had 66 volunteers that have mobilized with us, who've gone on expeditions with us. Um, we work with companies like Google and Salesforce and some other ones. Uh, we've designed 23 types of, of tech or, 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 or potential non or nonprofits or, or uh, startups, and we've raised just under $400,000 um, through this program. Um, I've already kind of talked about what, what we're working on, but essentially it's a lot, of, a lot of companies that you work for, like Google itself, have, you know, you have, I think, 30, 
40 hours or 30 hours of, or 20 hours of volunteer time off. So this is a volunteer time off opportunity that you can travel to another country, understand the issue at a deep level for about four or five days. And then at the end of the time is really where the magic happens, where we do a big hackathon. So we bring in locals, we bring in uh, experts, and we have a big hackathon. So a hackathon is essentially where um, ideas, people form around ideas, and then you try and create those in just a short amount of time. So ours is 54 hours, and the, the outcomes have been absolutely amazing. We've been so excited to see the different outcomes coming from them. Um, so some of them I want to highlight. Uh, I'll start with Banao. We have Elise, who was actually on the first expedition, and she's been a great ambassador to Effect. Um, and they started Banao, which was what they saw from some of the organizations. They made really amazing jewelry, but they didn't really have a platform to sell it. They didn't have a way to get it in front of people so they could actually make an income and actually increase the, the work that they were doing or make more money as a nonprofit. So they built a beautiful website, gave a platform then for them to sell it. Uh, sometimes when I go to Nepal, I pick up their shipping supplies <laughs> and bring it back with me. Um, but they essentially are creating an environment that they can sell more um, jewelry from this. And they're actually very much helping them on their, the whole cycle. I'm sure at least can tell you more about what they're doing. But um, it's really amazing to see the work that they've pulled together. We've seen another one, which is a tabula, which was essentially taking all the data from one of the organizations um, that they had for um, girls who've been trafficked and putting them on a heat map. Um, very simple, but actually understanding, you know, you know some of these hot spots of areas that are happening and how, and how they can essentially mitigate that to make decisions on where they should uh, put their focus. A very simple one was uh, plastering the brothels. So they went to brothels throughout um, Kathmandu and posted all these um, signs that said, you know, essentially that um, uh, that buying sex is punishable to law. Blah blah blah. If you've seen this Texas number, they got quite a few texts just in the few few nights that they did that um, and passed that off to another organization to run. So now we've seen some of these really amazing projects that come from these organizations and really affect expeditions is there to essentially support and help really the glue to bring you there, show you the organizations, see how you can get involved. But we're also the push to, to let you go on your own like a lease and to, to see how you can work on creating solutions yourself. How can you put your 20% or your 10% into making uh, solutions? So uh, really what we say is, you know, we, we put these back on you guys. Um, we put the burden back on you to see how you can help to make a difference. Um, some other really great organizations that are fighting human trafficking that we've seen. Um, New Light is one that you saw in the film. Uh, Destiny Foundation out of Kolkata. Seawind is the one with all the amazing, uh, they use the Google uh, Sheets. Uh, Shakti Samoa, uh, Shakti Bahini. These are some great organizations that we've seen that do really, really amazing work um, throughout India and Nepal. Um, we are running short on time. I want to do a Q&A with you guys. For, um, unless you want to see this video, it's two minutes. It's really in, uh, inspiring. So maybe this will help with, we'll, we'll do it. We'll do it real quick. The life of a woman um, in prostitution or a survivor um, is, the, is that of constant memory of that abuse. They just deal with their everyday lives like as if they're going through the motions of it. There is never any moment when they, where they can stop and actually connect with what is happening inside or even address that. The project we are working on right now is named Kalputaru which means the wish-fulfilling tree. And it is a holistic restorative retreat for women who have been victims and survivors of trafficking and who continue to be in prostitution. It's a program where women are exposed to dance, music, movement, working with clay, doing yoga, pranayam, and the Ayurvedic way of living. It's very, very different from their everyday lives. This is a project that we hope would touch their inner potential of fulfilling all this, all the things that they wish for. মানে ওখানে কি আমাদের নিজেদের ভেতরের মন থেকে যে ফ্রিলিটা মানে আমরা এখানে এসে বার করতে পারি ভেতরের মনে যে আমরা হয়তো সোনা তৈতে থেকে এখানে থেকে আমরা যে মুভমেন্ট গুলো করতে পারি না সব সময় একটা কাজের মধ্যে দিয়ে থাকি এগুলো করতে পারি না টাইম পাই না তো এইটা আমার কাছে সবথেকে বড় ইম্পর্টেন্ট আমার এখানে এই যে কল্পতরু অনুষ্ঠানে এসে আমার খুবই ভালো লাগছে এক্সারসাইজ করলাম তো 
অনেক রকম অনেক কিছু সিন দেখালো অনেক কিছু জানলাম শিখলাম ভেতরটা খুবই হালকা লাগছে খুব মনটা ফ্রি লাগছে খুবই ভালো লাগছে সবটাই তো ভালোই লাগলো সবটাই ভালো লেগেছে আমাদের আর বেশি ভালো লেগেছে ওই নেচে নেচে যখন যাই ওইটা খুব ভালো লেগেছে They've never been in a place like this. They've never experienced a loving touch the way they do at Kolkata. All of them are kind of reclaiming or reconnecting with parts of their childhood, which they were robbed of. When we see a group of young women dancing and laughing and rushing across the big hall, and there's this incredible energy of joy and total abandon, which is something they mustn't be expressing anywhere else. Every other transaction that happens in their lives is a calculated transaction. There's some kind of scheme going on there. Kintu, the shop din ki ta asa ta sambat na ghar ho ta ma ki thak ta ghar e thak e nana rakam chinta ane kisi mone ase samaj samaj gram na hoi di di ta lope samne ta kaadri aave na. আমি কষ্টের মধ্যে থাকতে চাই না অনেক কষ্টই পেয়েছি জীবনে আর এমনই মনে চিন্তা ভাবনা এসে গেছে যার কষ্ট জীবনে আসলেও সেটার পর সবসময় যেটাতে হাসবো যেটাতে খুশি থাকবো সেটাই করবো This is where they are their true beings, their true selves. And that is what Kolkata is all about. It is to release their potential, it is to make them feel who they are and that they are capable of infinite things. Um, I love, we loved filming that piece and we loved uh, working with the organization to see I don't know if you guys caught that, but those are prostitutes. Those are women who work on the streets every day. And we worked with them a lot on the streets um, as, as filming. And then to come to this program and to see them laughing and excited and putting clay on each other's face and doing all these things, it was so amazing to, see, to be a part of that and, and to give them a chance to see the light. And that's really what a big part of our film is, is humanizing these women. Um, they never, ever, ever chose this this profession, it was forced upon them. And uh, they've accepted it. They've accepted it because they find that it's their fate and that there's no other work for them. And so they continue to do it. Um, but they're still human beings. They still have aspirations. They still have dreams. They still have um, wants and needs. Um, and like the woman said, she doesn't always want to sit up and get pretty and, and you know do what she needs to do. But um, coming to programs like this are very important. But those programs cost money. <laughs> Um, so we hope through this film also that we can help essentially uh, aid with that and then give them more opportunities to grow and expand these uh, these programs so that they can do more good. Um, uh, you can make a difference. So these are some of the programs that we've done. I talked about before. We have expeditions uh, coming up. Uh, a lot of them are full, um, but we have a few spots coming up in July. We have spots coming up on the uh, rest of the year. Uh, I do have a sign-up sheet um, here. It's not a sign-up sheet. It's more like name and email, and we'll just email you more information if you want to come on one of these trips. And my team's here. I have my team members stand up so that we have uh, Nicole and Sandy, and then we have our board member, Moline, and then we have Elise, who's been on one of our trips. We have Matt, who's been on one of our trips. Uh, we have Chloe, who presents about our trips. So if you have questions, we're all here to answer those. Um, and we do have, looks like seven more minutes, I can answer some questions that you might have um, based on the presentation. So thank you. Yeah. Um, so, in our local area, Bay Area, can you speak to kind of what the food trafficking looks like there? Um, is it foreign individuals that are being trafficked? Is it local? Is it mean, what's, what does it look like? Right. So, the question was what does uh, trafficking look like here in the Bay Area? Um, I'm not an expert in this, but I will say from what I've understood that um, it is not so much about foreigners coming in, which it, uh, from what I understand, it's like 30, 40% are coming from other countries, but a uh, mass major majority of them are coming from our neighbors, neighboring countries, um, more from Mexico. I would yeah. add, so I work with an organization called Freedom House here in the San Mateo area, and there's a stat that 72% of the trafficking in the 
Yeah. In the back. How do we stay safe uh, with the crew uh, as filming? Yeah, I would be scared to make this film in the U.S. Um, to be honest, I think that it's a different environment. Um, in, in India itself is, um, and Nepal are quite safe environments, to be honest. Um, there are only a few times that we felt as if we needed to leave. Um, some of our strategies were actually coming in filming very quickly and then leaving very quickly. Uh, we would never stay in a city too long. We would always come back and film after a month or two. Uh, those are some of our techniques, but uh, we usually had really good, we, we mainly worked with Indians, like Indian producers and um, uh, chasers and runners that would help us understand drivers, understand the situation a little better and had a good ear on what was going on. Um, so if we caught a uh, word of too much uh, threats, then we would, we would move. There was no reason to stay. So, yeah. What was the collaboration with like U.S. embassies um, going in? Like, did you have to, like, what, what were you doing there? Um, how did you get visas coming in? Yeah. Yeah, so we, we did have, uh, we had uh, journalist visas um, for the filming part, um, and uh, that was about it. We were just seen as journalists, um, as filming with that. Um, we had no former permission from the U.S. government, or um, of course not from the Indian government, um, but uh, yeah, with the Indian government, it was much more of an understanding that we were coming to, uh, to make a film. So, yeah, Chloe. Go into a community, and let's say you're doing the film, and you're talking to a family whose daughter has been trafficked. What is sort of the sort of reaction from them? Are they then willing more to talk about it, or they just want their daughter back, and then that's kind of it? Or then do they sort of do you see mobilization in these small communities, or is it the concept just too kind of large for them to sort of participate? So the question is from parents who have girls who've been trafficked. Or the community in general, once it's yeah. sort of made a known to them, let's say, after, right? Yeah. Like, what is sort of the reaction? How do they, what do they do? Yeah, surprisingly, oftentimes, they're, they're very, very embarrassed. They're embarrassed that they let their daughter go, that they got trafficked, and uh, a lot of times, they won't talk about it too much. Um, if they do talk about it, um, we found if they do talk about it, they're freaking pissed. <laughs> they're really pissed, and they, and they see anyone that can help them, they will just, they will tell you everything. Um, and that was the case on probably, I'll say, 60% of our interviews of, of, of women of daughters from their parents who've been trafficked them. Um, like one of them we found, mm -hmm. she was walking home, we found her like on, on the street and we just pulled over and she was just like, mic me up and she was pissed. We got a great interview. Uh, her daughter was found, we did find her. Yeah, Matt. Um, so, kind of a pretty uh, harsh uh, situation, right? Fundraising, going over there and doing the hackathon, getting the word out here, getting the word out there. Yeah. I know it's an open question, but. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, how can we help in the general sense? All, all of the above, I know that's not the answer that you all want, but, um, you know, again, like, if you notice, a lot of the organizations that we highlight and we talk about are local organizations that are doing really good work, and we don't talk about the big organizations that we've seen. Um, the reason being is that they're pretty much taken care of. A lot of them, make, they raise really, really good money. Um, but we see that the impact with local organizations are so much higher, so much higher. And they work on such small budgets. And so we really push, we, we donate to, to a lot of these organizations actually. So a lot of the, a lot of the ways that you give to these lo local organizations a little bit, they seem shady on our end, but it's actually the legal way. It's like bank transfers and stuff like that, which is a bit odd for them. So we actually transfer a lot of funds to them. Uh, as far as getting involved, there needs to be tech solutions. There needs to be collaboration for these organizations, and they need tech. And so coming on these expeditions is a time for you to to get a deep dive of the of the issues, but also like see how you can help. Um, and also like we need to be having these conversations. Um, it seems that. Uh, people don't want to talk about human trafficking, but um, take this home, share it with your kids, share it with uh, your colleagues, and and um, let's talk about it. And Effect is always there to help as the glue, to help as any way that we can. We're a small organization. Uh, pretty much our whole team is here today, so <laughs> we are small and nimble, but yeah, in the front. In the front. Yeah, um, last question. Um, 
glad you actually brought up that, uh, that topic uh, a few years ago. Raising awareness, but it's like when I when the project was proposed, it was really shot down because it was just too dark to talk about. But it's the whole idea is raising awareness, and I was wondering if you have any tips, or suggestions, or any place that you can point us to in areas where we can raise awareness, or how to approach this topic so it doesn't scare people to be talking because it's starting a conversation about this. Oftentimes, when we get questions like. Um, the answer might be that we have to build it ourselves. I don't know if that's the right answer, but I don't know if we've seen the right platform where a safe environment where these can be talked about. Uh, there seems to be a very evangelical Christian um, uh, grassroots effort to help end this, which isn't for everyone. Um, on the other end, I don't know how to answer that. I, a lot of what I'd say is um, when we get those questions, we, we realize it's not there, and so we well, let's build it, let's do it ourselves. Uh, we saw that with a, a trip that we did to Kolkata. Uh, groups said the exact same thing. There isn't what we're looking for on the same platform that you said, and they built it. Still working on it. They're all Googlers too, so um, I can connect you with them. Be happy to. In the back, I think. No? Yeah, they, uh, sure. <laughs> No, it's super fragmented. Yeah. And uh, there was a startup that actually just got into Y Combinator that uh, I think it was two seasons ago or something like that, that technology for the FBI to use to understand better about the cases that they were working on, which is, which is really great. I mean, it's amazing to see a startup working only on uh, human trafficking issues. Uh, but they sold it. It was a for-profit, but so what? But yeah, I mean, we haven't really seen anything. And uh, to be honest, like Effect is looking, like our organization is looking for something to to champion um, with the right support from the right companies and all that. So um, again, we're open to, to champion one too.